four months and worked with a local human rights nonprofit where she focused on digital rights in Cambodia and LGBTQ rights in Cambodia. As we know from our discussion sessions, the Cambodian genocide is a distinctive one for a number of very important reasons. We're very fortunate to hear from someone with close association to that tragedy and insight into those tragedies. Welcome. Um, so I was actually born in Sonoma, Sonoma, the city, born and raised. Um, so, and interestingly enough, five, six years ago, I was in your seats. I didn't attend Sonoma State University, but Dr. Goodman was my senior project advisor at Sonoma High, where I did genocide awareness for my senior project. Um, and I sat in on different lectures here for the Holocaust lecture series. So it's different being on the other side of it. Um, so who knows if this is something that really interests you and something you want to pursue, maybe you'll end up back here. Um, so I just want to do a quick show of hands. Everyone raise your hand up in the air. How many people knew about the Cambodian genocide before this class? If you knew about it, put your hand down. If you knew about the Cambodian genocide, put your hand. If you did not know about the Cambodian genocide before this class, raise your hand. Okay, how many people learned about the Cambodian genocide in high school? So not as much, thank you. Thank you. Um, so that was one of the reasons why I wanted to do my senior project in high school about genocide awareness. And I did a little bit of focus on the Cambodian genocide because it's one of the I, I think it's one of the lesser known genocides that's happened in history um, for many different reasons, one of which I think it's about the survivors. Um, I can talk from my own family history. I had the one, the one reason I know a lot about the Cambodian genocide is because of one relative I have who would talk about it a lot. Everyone else in my family until very recently would not talk about it at all. My grandfather or my grandmother if I mentioned Cambodia or the, the genocide, they'd be like, oh, Poi Pot, which you'll learn is the leader of the Cambodian genocide. They'd be like, oh, in Chinese, like the black dog, like why do you want to talk about him? Like, let's not do it. So I think there's a lot of internalized grief, a lot of internalized anguish. And also I think in Cambodian and even Asian culture, I'll even broaden it. I think there's not as much terminology for, what should I say, um, mental health and thinking and trying to heal afterwards. I think there's a lot of, there's, you know, when it comes to, there's a healing process that needs to occur and I think it's hard for a lot of people in Asian culture because emotions and feelings aren't something that's often widely talked about. And I think in PT, if you have PTSD and things like that, so it's something you have to confront. And a lot of times the past isn't confronted. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that one of the reasons why the Cambodian genocide is something that's really important to talk about is because one quarter of the population of Cambodia was killed in four years. Putting it in a sort of like percentage of population, one of the quote unquote worst genocides that's happened in history, yet a lot of people don't know about it and don't learn about it. It's not something that's prominent. Cambodia isn't a sexy topic in class, you know? It's like you see different things, and I think especially in modern culture, there's a lot of sensationalism that happens, and Cambodia can't really be sensationalized. There's nothing to sensationalize. Lots of atrocities happen, and there's even a slight US involvement in it, which may lead to a sort of bias. So what I want everyone to get today is, my first objective is I want you to learn about Cambodia. I'm gonna give you a brief history, an overview of the history of Cambodia, um, diving into the genocide, a little bit of what happened there, the key players in the genocide, and then we're gonna shift. And my second objective is I want you to think. And that's a very vague thing, but I'm gonna try to hopefully get you to think about the perspectives of different actors in a peace building process and the justice system afterwards. Um, the topic of my presentation is overdue justice, and you'll see why very shortly. Um, so first, Let's learn about the history of Cambodia. That's the flag. <laughs> um, oh, so I'll show you. My, like, um, my parents were born in Cambodia. These are just some pictures of them 
that's my family on the right, to your right. Um, and this is taken at the refugee camps in, the, in Thailand, in Kawidung in Thailand. Um, so that's my dad back there. Hey, dad. <laughs> and he's over there. And I might put him on the spot later. <laughs> so an overview of Cambodia's history. Um, so we start off way, way, way back with the early Cambodian kingdoms. There was the establishment of the different trading states. Um, and then we move on to the Angkor Empire. And I think that's a little bit more iconic when people think about Cambodia. You think about, and I'll go back to the first photo, um, that's Angkor Wat in the background. You, that's what you think of, the temples of Cambodia, overarching. And I will say it's beautiful if you ever get a chance to visit Cambodia. It's a great piece of history to see. Um, and that was the rise of the Angkor Empire, um, where there was greater cohesion. Cambodia really expanded. Um, the king dubbed himself the Divine King. Um, and then after that, in 1113, that's when Angkor Wat was constructed. And you can see the Khmer Empire sort of really stretched out on this map here. Um, and that's a picture of Angkor Wat during the sunrise and um, Bayon Temple, which is one of the more famous temples. How many people learned about Cambodia because of, um, what's her name, Angelina Jolie? Anybody? Did anyone watch the movie? I didn't either, it's okay. Uh, Tomb Raider. So Tomb Raider, Laura Croft, a lot of those scenes are in Cambodia. Um, I've never watched it either, but there's some very like iconic pictures. We see the temples, and then there's like the trees and the ancient ruins. That's Cambodia and the temples. Um, moving on. So after this ancient period, there's a time when the French came into Cambodia. Um, in 1863, the French, Cambodia became a French protectorate. Um, and then in 1941, King Norodom Sihanouk became the king. And then the country became occupied by Japan during World War II, which was something that the king sort of welcomed at the time. Um, and then the French was kicked out. But as you can see in my slide, later on, France reimposed its protectorate. Um, but there was a new constitution that allowed Cambodians to form their own political parties. So what happens when you allow people to form their political, own political parties freely? They're gonna create them. So um, that led to Cambodia's independence in 1953, um, and then that's when the Kingdom of Cambodia was established. Sorry. In 1953, King Sinok, he abdicated the throne. He didn't wanna be in power anymore as like a king. Um, and gave power to his father. Um, but then after his father died, he pulled a, not a quite a bait and switch, but because he had a lot of political power already, um, he was able to become the head of state. And before that, he had already formed his own political, political party, became prime minister, and now it's sort of a bit of a double thing. Like he's the head of state, sort of royalty, and he yields a lot of power. And even now, his influence in Cambodia is still felt. And you can see pictures of him throughout the country. Um, so officially, he was neutral in foreign relations. He wouldn't really comment or anything like that. But unofficially, he definitely leaned towards those communist countries. And he had a general mistrust of the United States. Um, parallel to this, what was happening, a lot of so right, so in 1965, he broke off relations with the US, um, and then he allowed the communists in Vietnam to use Cambodian territory in the battle between US and South Vietnam. So now at this point, you have the Vietnam happening in parallel to, the, um, to what's going on in Cambodia, and the borders are next to each other. So you'll see a lot of spillage from that. So in 1969, the US created a secret bombing program on Cambodia. And this program has met with a lot of controversy. I can't remember the exact number, but there were thousands of tons of bombs that was dropped in Cambodia. And this led to even more mistrust of the US because you had the US bombing Cambodia. Granted, they were, the US was bombing um, communist targets within Cambodia, so that was the US's justification. Um, but that's, you know, whatever the justification is, um, it led a lot of the Cambodian people to not trust the US government and really move away from that. Um, 
but the US wanted more power. They were afraid of the, cam the communists inside Cambodia taking over, so they overthrew um, King Sihanouk, and that coup was led by General Lon Nol. Um, and from that point, Cambodia really descended into a lot of chaos, and this was a period of civil war that happened in Cambodia. Um, they said the army was sent to fight the North Vietnamese in Cambodia, and there was a lot of clashing. Um, simultaneous to this, in 1968, the communist Khmer Rouge was created um, within Cambodia, and they're an offset of like the Vietnamese People's Armies. So there you have just two different, like the two parallel lines, and you can see where they intersect. Um, when Sihanouk was part of, and I should say this, I should back up a little bit. Part of the reason Sihanouk was overthrown, and I think there was not a lot of, people didn't necessarily love him when he was in power. He was often out of the country, and when he was overthrown, he wasn't in the country at the time. Um, so there was like a fact that he's really into film, so he was like always traveling and everything. So it wasn't like the people at the time were his biggest supporter. Um, with that though, the people who he, the people who did support him um, saw that he ended up supporting the Khmer Rouge because the Khmer Rouge were still in the country. Um, they were the ones who were still against the US and the US was the one who overthrown him. So he led his, put his allegiances with the Khmer Rouge, which f led people to, led Cambodian people um, to follow the guerrillas in the Khmer Rouge in the jungles. Um, and I'll say, I should say this too, the Khmer Rouge, they were mostly, it's a very grassroots movement and they were on the outskirts. They weren't within, they weren't really within the city centers in Cambodia. Um, it was really just like a grassroots movement and they brought in more people as time went on. As the more bombings came, as more bombings happened within Cambodia, more people started following the Khmer Rouge um, and putting their allegiances towards them and that's how they were able to grow. Um, and then finally in 1975, Lon Nol was overthrown by the Khmer Rouge um, and there's this sort of iconic image, it's always said to me about how the soldiers really marched into the capital in Phnom Penh and just took over and that point it was done, the Khmer Rouge were in power. Um, and when that happened, they reset the clock back to year zero. So this is a really famous phrase of year zero. Um, the head of the Khmer Rouge, Poi Pot, which I mentioned before, and I'll talk about him a little bit more, he was French educated, Maoist, Marxist, all these texts he read, and he really wanted to bring Cambodia back. Um, he, he was emulating the Great Leap Forward, but he wanted to do it bigger, he wanted to do it better. Um, and so what they decided, he and his comrades and people wanted to reset the clocks to year zero. So that's why this term comes on. And if you hear about, learn about the Cambodian genocide and read more about it, you'll see this term thrown out a lot. Um, this, is a this is another so thing associated with Cambodia. And I think with a lot of different genocides as well, it's the image of skulls, skulls and bones, just because so many people died and were buried in mass graves. Even now in Cambodia, when you go back, if there's a lot of rainfall in certain areas, there'll be new bones that are dug up. So if you go to the killing fields, um, which is a very iconic site. It's a very sad site, um, but you know, as rain falls, new cloth is, emerges from the soil, new bones, just because there was that, that many deaths that happened. Um, but like I said, um, the objective of the Khmer Rouge, and they called Cambodia now from the Kingdom of Cambodia to, the Dem to Democratic Kampuchea, um, and they led from 1975 to 1970. Nine, so just four years. Um, and their objective was to establish a classless communist, communist state based on a rural agrarian society, a mouthful. But basically they wanted to return everyone back to sort of more peasant roots. The people who lived in the countryside, who had worked, those people were the ones who were put higher up on a pedestal. People who were intellectuals, who were educated, those were the people that they didn't like. Those were the people that, were, that had more atrocities, I would say, um, perpetrated against them, and those were the ones, the intellectuals were really rounded up. Um, when they marched into Phnom Penh, into the city's capital, uh, they 
forced everyone out of the capital into the countryside, and people in like the countryside cities were pushed out further into the countryside. So my parents were in Batambang, which is near the border of Thailand, up in the it's north. Um, and they lived in the city of Batambang, but they were forced to move further out. On foot, take what you have. Take what you, it was like literally just they came in, you need to leave, take what you can carry, and that's it. Currency was abolished, there's no more currency, and everything that was done on the road was based on trading. Um, one of the things I remember my aunt telling me was they brought needles with them, sewing needles, and that ended up being a really hot commodity. Why? Because you don't have any clothes. Like, you have the clothes on your back and that's pretty much it, so the needles became really helpful because you were able to repair your clothes. So, just a short anecdote. Um, but, like I said, going back to what happened in Cambodia, but it was modeled after the Great Leap Forward, um, and different killing sites were created within Cambodia. Um, S21, also known as Tool Sling, was one of them, and I'm gonna talk about that further because it's very important. Um, and like I said, 1.7 million, and that's a rough estimate. Um, some estimates go even higher to about 2.2 million people um, were killed. So if we go by the 1.7 million number, that's about 21% of the population just disappeared in four years in very terrible ways. Um, So these were the leaders of the Khmer Rouge. So first you have Poi Pot, and he was known as brother number one. So all of the head leaders in the Khmer Rouge, they were called brothers. And I think it's to, it's a different mindset um, that they're trying to put in. They're your friends, they're your brother, they're not your parents who's necessarily watching over you, even though they are, but they're your brother. So Poi Pot was brother number one. He died in 1998, and he really let out these atrocities. Like I said, he was educated in France, so he had a very clear mind about what he wanted to do um, during the genocide. Um, the second person is Nun Chia, and he was known as Poi Pot's right-hand man, um, and he ended up personally executing a lot of people and also put down orders for different people to be executed. Um, and he was known as brother number two. Um, there's brother number three, whose name's Ayang Seri. He was the deputy prime minister. Um, there's Hugh Sampan, brother number four. And he's really known um, for killing a lot of the indigenous and killing the minority population. So in Cambodia, it's a lot of, you know, Khmer. I'll use the term Khmer, Cambodian born. But there was also a lot of ethnic minorities within Cambodia. So you have the Jam people, which is a Muslim-based religion. Um, there was a Chinese population there as well. And those people weren't trusted as much because they weren't pure Cambodian. Um, so they were one of the ones where a lot of violence was perpetrated against um, because they were known as an other and a different offset group. So they were also, lots of crimes were perpetrated against them. Um, and then the last sort of head leader is Ta Mok. Um, and he was, sort of, he was the Southwest Regional Secretary, um, and he is also dead. So the only people who are still alive are Nun Chia and Kyo Sampan. Poipot died in 1998. Um, I'm gonna leave that. I'll leave that there for now. Let's talk about it further, oops. So, King Kek Eve, uh, he's the leader, and I, he has his own side because he led S21. He was also known as Comrade Doik, and S21, or Tool Slang, you'll hear it differently. Um, S21 is like sort of the nickname for it. He, I think is one of the, it's a terrible place, I'll put it plainly, um, but there, like you said here, 17,000 people entered, only seven survived in this period, and from what he took from, I think, a lot of like the Nazi regime was a very, he was very meticulous about his documentation. So those 17,000 people, I'm pr it's a pr I believe it's a pretty accurate number just because you can see the photos on the side. Everyone who entered S21 was photographed. Everyone was interrogated. Everyone was forced to write confessions and write their history. So when you go to S21 today, because it's a museum, families can go back and search through records to try to find family members. It's, those records are that meticulous. There's pictures. Um, and like you'll see on the side here, 
It's kind of hard to see, but those were the, some of the prison cells. They're pretty small, like pretty much, it looks like there might be some more space there. There really isn't, and in some cases, the cells were even smaller than that. They were in captivity. Um, and a lot of the times, I think, they were there for about two to three months before they were killed, sometimes even less. Um, and like I said, they were, they were forced to write confessions. And a lot of times that's fake. You know, there are a lot of the people when you're in that mindset, you're being tortured day by day. You'll write whatever you think they want to hear, but you know, no matter what they said, they would have died. Um, so you can hear some of the survivors today. There's a couple of them that are still alive. Will actually um, sit at S21, and you can meet with them if you ever go there, um, which is a really sort of empowering and eye-opening experience to see some of the survivors. Um, also in S21, when you go there, they'll have pictures of sort of the different torture areas and what would happen. I think one of the things they would do, which was really striking to me when I went, is they had these like giant palm trees or some sort of coconut trees. Um, but there's a picture there, a hand-drawn picture, of babies being thrown against them. And that was just the reality of it. You know, you didn't really survive in the camp. Like, you tried to survive during the Khmer Rouge regime, but a lot of times you didn't. Um, for, I think, story from my, from my family during this time is my grandmother on my mom's side, she just had a baby, but then my grandfather got sick. So then they had to face a really real choice I think a lot of times this is what happened is, do you take the money, and the money, but like the food that you're trading, do you save the baby or do you save your husband? And in the end, you have to save the person who's going to be able to sort of help you on, t on this continuous journey. So. so now I want to, that's a little like, Brief history of the Khmer Rouge. Does anyone have questions about that so far? Just like about the history? Yeah. No, I was born here. So my parents came over in, I believe it was 1980 something. Dad? <laughs> what year did you come to America? <laughs> what? 81. So they were living under the Khmer Rouge regime in 1979. I think that's when they went to the refugee camps in Thailand. They were moved to the Philippines and then ended up here in the US as refugees. Fun fact, they had to pay for their plane ticket to the US afterward. Interesting note. I didn't know that. I learned that a few weeks ago when I was talking about that afterward. The US was like, oh, time to pay up. You've been in the US long enough. Um, but. <laughs> So, any other questions about the history before I sort of pivot? Oh, yeah. Um, S21 is definitely the mo most iconic. There's the Killing Fields, um, which is another place where I think oh, there's not as much, to it's not necessarily a torture center, but a lot of people were carted and just shot in mass quantities. Um, so I, I believe S21 is really the main, the biggest one. And S21 was also located in the center of Phnom Penh. It's in the center of the city, um, and it's based in a high school. So that place, this torture center, used to be a high school. It's still there. It's really chilling to go by because, you know, now you're go you go, like when you're riding downtown, house after house after house, and then all of a sudden it's this giant torture center in the middle of the city. And that was the reality that a lot of the people were living with. Yeah, so a lot of intellectuals were targeted. Um, some of the people, in the, I think, in, in S21 were named by other people within S21, and there was a lot of people who were sort of in power before during um, the old regime that were brought into S21 because they really wanted to just wipe out that population. And a lot of the times, the soldiers in S21, I think, and you probably learned that in different cases of genocide as well, they were kids because that's when, you know, it's a sad reality, but you get them fresh and come in and you teach them and it's brainwashing because they don't know anything else and they just want to survive. Um, and even that 
with that too. People who killed people in S21 oftentimes were later on killed in S21 as well. Sort of like leaving no trace. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The Killing Fields is, is an iconic movie, something I haven't sort of worked my way up to see yet. So that. Yeah. What, did they have a special extermination program for them, or did they go to S21 too? Um, I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure. I don't know if. Do you have any insight on that? I don't. I don't. I think a lot of the things too. I think that makes a really great point about religion. They really wanted to wipe out religion, and Buddhism was. It's rooted deeply into the into Cambodia, and even now, it's the prominent religion. I think you know a lot of times you see in the Philippines or different um, Asianic countries. There was, there was a lot of like movement of like Christianity coming in. Christianity never, Christianity never really penetrated Cambodia at all. So there was, even now, there's I think 99% of the population in Cambodia is Buddhist. Um, and the Khmer Rouge wanted to really get rid of that. I saw a question, yes. No, so a lot of the, the survivors, they lived because they were deemed useful. So there is one survivor who tells the story because he was a really good artist. So the reason he survived was because the Khmer Rouge made him paint the different paintings that are there today about the different tortures that happened in the um, during that happened in S21. So these some of these people were really of use and they found them useful. They were still prisoners, um, but that's part of the reason they survived. Or I think some of them may have came in a little bit later, um, but towards the end especially when they knew that they were going to fall and the regime, the Khmer Rouge's rule was going to be over, their rule was going to be over, um, they just ended up just killing a lot of people very quickly, um, as opposed to less regimented ways. Yes. Um, I can talk about it a little, in terms of... So, yeah, oh, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so this is my opinion, and I think with any of these classes, I want you to take my opinion with a grain of salt, and hopefully if it intrigues you, take it, read more about it, and form your own opinion, but keep your mind open. So for me, I think one of the reasons why the Cambodian genocide isn't as well known and isn't as well publicized or learned about because there can be a case made of the US's involvement in the Cambodian genocide. Um, at that time, you know, Nixon didn't really want to be involved in too much because of the Vietnam War. But the US, like I said earlier, sent tons and like thousands and ton thousands of bombs within Cambodia. And this is that's one of the main, I believe one of the main reasons the Khmer Rouge was able to get so many people from the cities um, to, on their side because the U.S. was bombing Cambodia. And the U.S. helped to overthrow Xi Hanuk, um, and that's when Lan Ol came to power, which just led, led to further mistrust of the government. Anything else? Okay. So I'm going to shift a little bit. Um, and now, so all these terrible things happened, terrible, terrible things. So what happens next? Um, how many people have like, if I say the word justice, you have a broad understanding of what justice is? Most people, students, raise your hand, I wanna see hands, yeah. So who wants to give me a, just a quick definition of justice? Quick definition, I will call, I'm not sure if I'm a student, I will call on someone unless someone volunteers. Students. Come on, I know it's, there's no, there's no wrong way. Anyone? I'm gonna call on someone. Who's avoiding eye contact? I see you. <laughs> um, in the plaid shirt, what is your definition of justice? Of like, just a brief, when, you say, when I say justice, what do you think? Oh, okay, being equal, and like, so what about if I say, justice after some atrocity has happened. What do you think of what is justice? Anyone else? Be back, yes. Punishments for crime, good. 
anyone else about this thing? Yeah. Okay. That's great. Doing what's right to fix what happens. Now, who, and I'm going to pose some questions out there because I want to get you thinking, and there's really no right or wrong answers about this, but think about who is justice for? Who, I, I'm just great question. Who is the one who decides how justice is served? What are their reasonings and logic behind that? Um, and who does it serve? What is, who is justice supposed to be serving here in any situation? And of course, like I'm going to be, I'm trying to frame it a little bit more with the Cambodian genocide and what's happened. Um, but you know, this is something that I think everyone should think about, and that's where sort of my cultural anthropology background, because I think culture, um, culture and justice go hand in hand. Because the only, I think, the only way you can effectively have change is by, you know, thinking about the culture that you're trying to induce change to, and it has to be sort of a grassroots thing up. But that's a slight digression. Um, but yeah, so we're thinking about justice. So think about this: like, who who is giving out the justice? And I'm gonna go through the history of what's, ha what's happened with the Khmer Rouge trials. Who is this justice supposed to be for? And I think another question, important question, how do you know when the justice is effective? And I believe you guys have talked a little bit about the ICC, maybe Yugoslavia, Rwanda. So you've learned about those cases. Now we're talking about a very different one, and this is a very unique case. Um, but those are the questions I want you to think about as I'm presenting these facts, um, and I'll infuse some opinion in it too, but also when you're examining other cases of mass atrocities and things like that, this justice process afterwards. Um, so I think I just wanted to put up some phrases, transitional justice, retributive justice, restorative justice, um, just different ways you can have justice. And I think in with what's going on in Cambodia, I think it's technically a transitional justice. Um, there's a little bit of restorative justice happening here, along with the traditional court trials, and there's a lot of there's a restitution process for the victims. Um, so the road to the Khmer Rouge trial is a very, very long one. So the Khmer Rouge ended in 1979. And in 1997, the royal government, Cambodia, now the new government, um, requested the UN to assist in um, organizing the Khmer Rouge trials. In 1999, after you know bureaucracy that happens, but they want to put together a group. They put together a group of experts to figure out the best way to have this trial, and they recommended, like in a lot of cases in history, to have this trial as an ad hoc trial outside of Cambodia. Why? Why is it good to have a trial outside of Cambodia in the country? Students, come on, guys, I know this is hard. Four, go, yes. No revolutions, what else? Anything else? Yeah. Assassinations. Um, I think a lot of times it's also to eliminate bias and intimidation um, because if it's happening within the country and in the case of Cambodia as well, a quarter of the population was killed, and that left, so that's three quarters of the population is left in Cambodia, and a lot of those people who weren't the high-level criminals, um, the five that I showed in the beginning, or even like their comrades on that top-tier level, they're still in Cambodia. They're the ones that are walking amongst everyday people who are, a lot of these people who are like mid-level people were the ones that perpetrated a lot of the killings. They're still there in Cambodia today. Um, including the current, I guess, prime minister, head of state. Um, he also had some Khmer Rouge backgrounds, which I'll go into a little bit after. Um, so Cambodia, who is led by Hun Sen now, um, rejected this idea, said, no, we don't want an ad hoc trial outside of Cambodia. We want it in the country. So then negotiations went back and forth for years. And this trial really never got off the ground. And it's for a long time. Um, with trials like this, you have to find funding. It's ma money doesn't magically appear from anywhere. So a lot of times, too, they came up with a lot of monetary issues of where the money was going to come from, what countries would be donating to the trial. 
Um, finally, in 2003, there was an agreement reached um, between the UN and the royal government of Cambodia, and it's this really long name, and they call it the Prosecution Under, oh, typo, Cambodian Law of Crimes Committed During the Period of Democratic Kampuchea. Short term, um, people call it the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, the ECCC, or more people on the ground call it the ECCC because too many acronyms these days. I'm sure you guys know if you're in school, so many acronyms everywhere. Um, but finally, in 2006, the Cambodian genocide ended in 1979, and in 2006, that's when um, the trials were finally set up. And in 2007, that's when the courts became operational. Um, I'll throw this back. You guys talked about Yugoslavia, right? OK. Does anyone remember when the ICTY was sort of cre established? What year? I'm sure these glazed over. Anyone know? <laughs> yes, 1993. Um, and sort of the wars in former Yugoslavia took place from 1991 to 1995. So about two years after um, these wars were happening, the ICTY was established. 1979, 2007, 30 plus years. Um, so with this, I want you to think about when justice is delayed, topic of sort of like my title, does it make justice less effective? Just think about that. Can you answer? Just think about it. So to further complicate things in Cambodia, um, the ECCC, oh, oh, here, let's go again. Okay. Speaking, going back on the trials, what makes the, Kimbo, the ECCC really unique is that it's a hybrid court system. Um, the courts are set up in Cambodia. You can go today and visit. And what's, I think what's a, one really great thing about the courts is if you are like born Cambodian and you're a victim, they have free buses that will take you to the trials that you can see. So they're on full display. You can watch them online. You can stream them online. Um, and they're also in French and English so you can understand what's going on. But the UCCC is a hybrid court, um, and all of, so you have like the different chambers of office still, the Supreme Court, you have your trial chamber, pre-trial chamber, the co-investigating judges, um, but all of the judges, I think um, it's a hybrid of Cambodian people and inter like Cambodian judges and international judges. So that was one of the bigger things um, that came out and what makes Cam the East Triple C unique is that there's not only international um, judges on the court, but also Cambodian judges. And there's also, there's an odd number, and the Cambodian judges outweigh the international judges. Um, the, to br lessen the scope of the ECCC, they only have jurisdiction over crimes that happened during democratic Kampuchea. So April of 1975 to January of 1979, um, and the jurisdiction, the personal jurisdiction of this court is limited to senior leaders of the Democratic Kampuchea, of Democratic Kampuchea um, and those who are most responsible for the crimes committed during um, Democratic Kampuchea. So in this process, none of like the mid-level or like the lower level individuals are being prosecuted. Um, and there's gonna be no move to prosecute those individuals. I think partially because there's such a huge number of them that are living in Cambodia today that you really can't without wiping out a lot of the population. And you can't, I think in a lot of cases with a genocide like this, um, a lot of people you can't say had their hands clean in it. Um, but also the subject matter of the jurisdiction included torture, murder, and religious persecution, crimes against humanity, grave breaches of the 1949 Geneva Convention, um, destruction of cultural property, like we talked about earlier. You know, Buddhism was something that was very prominent. Um, so you have a lot of like temples being destroyed during this time, a lot of cultural artifacts, um, a lot of things within the heritage of Cambodia. Um, so yeah, okay, so just a little more background of the trial. Um, so like I said, to complicate things more, and I think in a way, in sort of bureaucratic 
process, they really wanted to boil down what are the key things that we're trying to prosecute here during um, the ECCC. So they've broken it down into four cases. Um, the first case is against Kangek Eve, who, like I said earlier, led this S21 torture chamber. Um, he was ended up sentenced to 35 years in prison at imprisonment on in 2010. This verdict was appealed, um, and then in two years later, there was a final judgment against him, which um, led to life imprisonment. When this, so this was the first case, case one, the first case that was tried, um, the first case that was closed, and the first case that had a judgment passed against it. And in 2010, I think there was a lot of unrest amongst the Cambodian people because they were unsatisfied with the 35 years of imprisonment because they just believe it's such a low number for all of the people and all of the murders that have been committed under your rule. Um, so that decision was appealed and has turned into a greater life sentence, which I think people are a little bit more satisfied with. And Poi Pot won't be tried because he's dead. <laughs> I'm just throw it out there. Um, case number two. Case number two was broken down into two sort of sub-cases. Case 002-01 um, started in 2010, where Nun Shia and Kyu Sampan, they were indicted of charges against humanity in 2014. Four years later, just two, three years ago, they were found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Um, both of these cases, I have five names listed up there. It was supposed to be charged against all, or four names actually. These four people, so Nun Chia, Kyo Sampan, Ayang Suri, and Ayang Suris. Um, but Ayang Suri, he died during this time because the perpetrators of this genocide are just, they're older. Um, so the, what's gonna, like people get sick, people die. Um, and I, I, Ayang Suri um, is his wife. She was found mentally unfit to stand trial um, because she had dementia. And I'm just going to go back quickly so you can see. So you have Nunchi and Kyo Sampan and Aing Suri. So the pictures of the people who are a little bit older, um, these were those three photos of Nunchi, Aing Suri, and Kyo Sampan. This was them, two pictures have taken them during the courts. Oh, and they're the ACCC. They have the head, he has the headphones here because you need translation. Um, so they were there, they stood trial, Aing Suri passed away, um, so he was never tried. Um, so, there was two, so the first case, Dash 1, um, was focused in on crimes against humanity because they wanted to really, um, not broaden the scope, the opposite of broaden the scope, they really wanted to just like nail down, have a, really sm have a smaller scope of indictment. Um, and then there was case number 2, that, I guess, 002-2, that began in 12, um, 2014, and that's still ongoing. Um, and a little bit, that case is more about um, genocide against the Jam and the Vietnamese people in Cambodia, um, so there's a smaller scope there. And this is more about the atrocities happening against um, the smaller groups of people in Cambodia. Um, and then there's cases three and four. So cases three and four are still pretty much in their introductory phases. We're in 2017, again, genocide ended in 1979, um, and the investigating judges and as investigating prosecutors, um, I believe one name has come out for case three, but in case four, there hasn't been really any indictments laid out yet. And they have, the courts have said, they're not going to pursue any cases past case four. Um, so this is more, these are crimes against, so these, the people charged in these cases aren't going to be those five heads that I talked about because the people who are still alive have been charged already. Um, these are people who are a little bit, slightly lower level, but how are, that there's a mass awareness that they've committed a lot of atrocities. Um, um, so, oh. Sorry about that. Um, I'm gonna skip to slide four. So to give some more context, and I have some dates plastered up here, um, and I keep mentioning the dates and the question of, you know, when justice takes so long, is it effective? Does it matter anymore? Um, but you can see, like I said, 1993, ICTY was established. There was 161 indictments. For the ICTR, there was 95 indictments. 
Um, and then in Nuremberg, there was about 22 Nazi German leaders were tried. And in Cambodia, there was about three, potentially five, maybe a little bit more. And that's it. So I'm telling you all of this and posing all these questions to you. So what? What are you supposed to take from this? And I think my objective of wanting you to think critically about these trials, about what happens in the peace building process afterwards, that's the so what. Not to blindly accept what happens. So for, for the UN and international actors, what is their reasoning for wanting these trials to happen? Do you think? Put, the, put yourself in their shoes. If you are a UN actor and you are like, this has happened, what's the point of having these trials? Yeah, go. Good thought. Anybody else? Why? Yeah. Any other thoughts? If you were a UN actor, a national actor, why do you want these trials to happen? Yeah. So if you're, pivot point, if you are a victim, if this genocide has been perpetrated against you, why do you want these trials to happen? I'll go back there first. <laughs> Anyone else? If you're a victim, if this something like this happened to you, why do you want these trials to happen? Yeah. Closure. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. These are all really great points, and I would say a lot of I think. If you read up on it, a lot of the people, a lot of the victims of the Cambodian genocide, they saw this trial happening as a way, I think, of, like I said, to rebuild afterwards. I think what they wanted to see a lot of the times, you know, they wanted to hear about what exactly happened. A lot of what happened during the Khmer Rouge regime was shrouded in secrecy. A lot of people didn't know who Poi Pot was during the time. They didn't know who the leaders were. They just had the local people on the ground um, telling them what to do, giving them their orders. So they wanted to understand. They wanted to hear from these leaders why, how this is all happening. And I think the court, like we said, the court was a great way to do that. So I'm going to pose one more question about if, and I think this is a question that I struggle with too a lot of time, if a court system isn't your method of justice, if this isn't the way that justice in your, like in your hometown, in your culture, if this isn't the way justice happens, is this trial effective to you? Does this trial matter to you? And I think that can be said too about anything in like crimes against humanity, unfortunately, are continuing to happen, are going to happen. Um, and that's sort of like my edge of where culture comes into play. How are these trials effective? When do you know that they're effective? Who are these trials serving? Is it serving the international actors who might be feeling guilt, who want to, you know, now after the fact to do something about it? Or should it be serving the victims? Or not victims, the survivors, the people who have endured the struggle. Um, and how do you make it useful for them to see? And I think Cambodia has been great in terms of trying to bring survivors to see the court. Um, you know, like I said, you can take a van, they have a free van, and they provide lunch for you, you can go and watch the trials. And I think a lot of people, and you have, um, there are numbers on it, like thousands, hundreds of thousands of Cambodians have gone and see these trials. But unfortunately, those senior leaders aren't the ones that they really know who had these crimes perpetrated against them. Um, so you can sort of think about that. It's like, is it, has it been effective for them? Is that what they want to see? Uh, there's some great statistics. And granted, these are old statistics. This happened in 2010 after the first case happened. Um, so there was 
the ECCC, um, there was a there's a local human rights organization called Ad Hoc, um, and they created a poll. So before um, about the, talking about the expected impact, so they pulled some people. Will the ECCC help promote national reconciliation? In 2008, before the trial started, it was 67%. Afterwards, it was 83%. And you can see that people have, the Cambodian people, a lot of Cambodian people who were polled in this, uh, and I'll put that caveat on there, um, they believed in the effectiveness, effectiveness of this. Um, you can look on the other side of the victim's opinions, why people wanted to, why people were motivated to participate as a civil party, to tell their story of their suffering, so so they can so they wanted their suffering to be acknowledged. They wanted to get justice for their loved ones. They wanted to receive individual reparations. Um, this victim opinions poll too. It's you can see the note. It's about the two thousand ad hoc assisted civil part civil parties. Um, so these, the people they polled were people who actually helped in the trial and to help give statements. Um, so this is just a small cross-section of Cambodia. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I pointed that out when you look at the statistics, because they seem very high. Um, but you think about it, if these people are willing to come forward and to talk about their story, then of course they see some effectiveness in it um, and want it to happen. So. How many people think, I want to hear your opinions about, do you think this trial is effective? It's still going on today. You can still go to the courts and see it. I got a chance to go. You can go visit um, and see the courts happening about it. But when a crime has been committed 30 plus years ago and the trials are still going on, do you think that's still effective? Do you find it useful? a really good question and I there is literature on that um, and I'm not as well informed about that and I think to your point though you know Buddhist culture it's about reaching enlightenment um, it's there's a lot of passive like I said passiveness in the culture um, so I I honestly don't know the answer to that um, but I know when I've seen literature about it it's just something that I personally haven't researched so I think that's a really interesting topic piece though um, that I know I'm going <laughs> to look into afterwards Um, there is t there three. three. Yeah, there's three. We're what putting about the ordinary perpetrators, the people who actually carried out the orders? Nothing has really happened to them at all. So that's what I was saying about like mid-level people and the people on the ground. There hasn't been a lot of repercussions at all. Um, the head of Cambodia right now, Hun Sen, he used to have allegiances to the Khmer Rouge too. And he's the one in power right now. And there's a lot of, I think, in Cambodia too, like a lot of what's happened during the Khmer Rouge has bled over. Um, and it's still deeply affecting Cambodia today. Um, so for me, when I think about has these trials been effective, I think you see the statistics of these people, and it says, you know, after the trial, people believed that the trial was going to rebuild trust in Cambodia. I think this is like 83%. That's a, over, that's a very large number. However, while the trials may provide some sort of sense of relief, may give you some sort of sense of 
closure, the people you're standing next to, some of the people you walk by on the street, the people in your government, are still the ones who perpetrated a lot of these crimes on the ground. So you're walking alongside them all day. And I think there's a couple of stories you can read online where people like talk about seeing the people that they saw murder other people, like murdered their family on the streets in Cambodia because they're, those four cases, those are the only things that's being tried in Cambodia. Mm-hmm. And we spend a lot of time talking about how the, the, the job that Germany did in educating the Coptics yep. about the Holocaust. So how is Cambodia processing its genocide? What do people who go to the schools in Cambodia learn about that period? I don't think they are. And I've talked about this a little bit with my family members in Cambodia when I was there. And it's something that's I think they learn about a little bit. But there, that's the point. There is no processing that's happening afterwards which leads into sort of more of why the Cam I think the Cambodian genocide isn't really talked about because there is none of this processing happening. People aren't people in the country aren't learning about it because if they're learning about it they're learning about it from the people who had these <laughs> who did the crimes. Um, so I think a lot of the times with this I think that's why I sort of I'm a big fan of the guitar trials because that's where you bring in the culture of the people. You know, the guitar trials were something that People in Rwanda, that's what they knew. Um, and of course, there was some different imbalances because you know the death penalty would be allowed in the Gachacha trials, I believe. But in the UN court, the death penalty isn't um, allowed. Um, but the people on the ground, they were the ones affecting, creating this justice process. And I think that's what made it more effective, in a sense, because of that. But in Cambodia, you don't have any of that. Yeah, so that's where um, S21, Tool Slang, that's a museum that you can go to. And a lot of people go there. Um, the Killing Fields are there. Um, like I said, a lot of, in the Killing Fields, which is, there's the movie about it, a lot of people are just rounded up on buses, took, taken to the Killing Fields, dig your grave. They were shot and killed and crossed there. And that's another museum that you can go see in Cambodia. Um, but also, a lot of the structure within Cambodia, while things have changed, um, my dad went back. My dad and I went back to Cambodia last year when I did my internship in Cambodia. That was the first time he was back since he left, um, and he was still able. We went back to his town in um, Battambang, and he was still able to pick out where he lived and to see because a lot of the structures there remain the same. Um, there's been some shifting, and even now you're going to see a lot of changes. A lot of there's a lot of infrastructure changes happening because of how the political climate in Cambodia is. They're bringing in a lot of foreign investors. Um, but as it stands right now, you can, oh, I think a lot of people can sort of go back to where they were and sort of like feel their way and find where they were and sort of what happened and see what happened there. But those were like the big um, S21 tool slang um, and the killing fields are like the two really big genocide centers that you can go and see. There was a student back here. Oh, yeah.
Um, okay. So the first question was about what's happening right now in the school system. Uh, unfortunately, I can't speak to a lot of what people are learning in schools there. Um, Lucia, do you want? Do you have? Um, and just to provide context, everyone, this is Dr. Roncalli. Um, she's a doctor in Santa Rosa. She works with my aunt very closely. Um, and they do a Cambodian women's group together, Cambodian Genocide Women's Survivor Group. Um, so Dr. Roncalli has a lot of insight um, about what happened in Cambodia and sort of the aftermath about it, too. And she often presents where I am now. Um, so I'm really glad to have her here. Thank you for that. Um, please remind, oh, the economic ramifications. Um, Cambodia right now, I think in terms like right now, what's happening, Cambodia still is one of the more like impoverished countries, I would say, in Southeast Asia. Um, there's a lot of human rights issues that are still occurring in Cambodia today, and I think part of that's the ramifications from the Khmer Rouge that's happened. Um, Hun Sen has really tightened the hold on freedoms in Cambodia. Um, one of the examples is digital rights, which is something I study, that I help to do research with. But a lot of Cambodians in Cambodia will have a second Facebook profile. So, you know, if you have your, it's like having a Finstagram. Anyone have a Finstagram? It's your fake Instagram. Um, it's like where you have like your real friends, you know? Um, but so in Cambodia, because they're really, concerned about the government cracking down and seeing what they post, um, they'll have a second Facebook that's not their real name or anything like that. Because the Hun Sen, the head of the government, the head of people, has explicitly said, if you say anything bad against the government, we will find you within a few hours and we will prosecute you. And that is, so there's a lot of things that are still happening in Cambodia like that, the human rights abuses, um, and I think it's a direct contribution to the Khmer Rouge. Uh, economically, like I said, there's a lot, still a lot of people who live in the countryside. I have some relatives who just never left the countryside or are still living there. They have like water buckets and things, um, you know, large buckets. But also in terms of reparations, I know part of the reparations that they wanted after the trial was, it wasn't necessarily, it was monetary, um, but it was also about honoring the people who had died. And that goes into like the Buddhist culture, um, wanting to honor the dead and burying the dead. And a lot of it was, I th I, if I remember correctly, it was about getting money so they can create a proper shrine for their ancestors. Um, so then they can sort of pay homage to their ancestors um, in this present time. I think a lot of the country is still pretty impoverished. And you can see it. It's interesting, a different topic, but in terms of gentrification, you can see that sort of happening in Cambodia as well, where you have a lot of foreign investors coming in, a lot of people being pushed out of their communities because they just can't afford it anymore. And there's a pretty decent expat population also. I, well, 
Well, I think that's like for me and sort of what I've read about it, like there isn't. And I think that's what makes it so, when this genocide so impactful too is because there hasn't been that, there hasn't been a real healing process. And the trials are great because it does create a sense of closure for some people. Um, but a lot of times I think there's a lot of hatred still. A lot of Cambodian people have a lot of hatred. My aunt was just like, she said, she's like, yeah, the trials are great, but I'd rather them just not be alive. And that's a very, it's a, you know, it's a valid reality for people to have. It's having all these terrible things happen, but they're just, you know, there hasn't been healing. I don't think Cambodia is really gonna be able to move on as a country. I think there's a lot of deep-rooted issues that are happening there um, that's preventing this healing nationwide and, and even on a smaller scale and a family level. There's not, so besides sort of like the terms of like you're an intellectual, um, you've been educated, you live in the countryside, I don't, either, <laughs> oh yeah, glasses, if you wear glasses, um, that was like a, you know, a visual target. There, there I don't, if I remember correctly, and feel free to correct me, but there really isn't that much separation, which I think lays into the complicatedness of it, because, you know, there isn't a real distinction. Like I said, you know, not everyone, in certain, I think in one way or another, the people who were there may have helped to perpetrate the genocide, whether it was naming someone because they were under duress and there's guilt associated with that. Um, but it's really, there is no separation. There really isn't. Yeah, there's schools, um, there's a lot of different schools established. There's also a lot of like international schools in Cambodia um, these days, and there are universities. Um, not as prominent, I think the education isn't as great as other countries, um, but there is an education system that's there and that's in place, um, and students, students are mandated to attend school, so. Yeah, so, yeah, um, his question was about LGBTQ rights in Cambodia and sort of how it compares to the US, right? So what's interesting about LGBTQ rights, and I think you'll, you might hear about this in a lot of other countries, is a lot of Western notions and a lot of Western terminologies has pushed itself into a lot of different countries um, and has, in a sense, I think, caused more turmoil um, and has created, has made the LGBTQ group, LGBTQ group um, more of sort of a subculture. And an example of this is I did um, some field research on transgender women in urban centers. Transgender was not a term in Cambodia before the Westerners had coined this term. Um, and a lot of the women that I interviewed, I went on interviews for, if you ask them, like there was a list of like, what do you consider yourself as? Like your gender, what do you consider yourself as? A lot of them didn't choose transgender. There's different terms in Cambodian, like pretty boy. A lot of them didn't see themselves as male or female or saw themselves as male. Um, so I think, so that's what I'm saying about a lot of Western terminology has pushed its way into foreign countries. Um, and now there's an outgroup. Um, and I definitely saw that happening in Cambodia because now people are deemed as gay or lesbian. Um, so they're on the outs, whether, as before, it was sort of like, oh, okay, like you're a little different, but you're an accepted, like you're just, you're just a little different, and now there's a label on it, and seeing how Western countries have reacted to um, LGBTQ populations, I think that's sort of going into the psyche of a lot of the top leaders in a lot of foreign countries, um, and sort of push their thinking and how they want to address things. Uh, one interesting thing about that in Cambodia, if there are a lot of cases in sort of outside provinces where if one person decide, will write on their um, marriage certificate that they're like the male, if it's like a, a female to female wedding, um, they'll allow that marriage to happen legally. Um, that's something that's happened previously. And I think with that, that's something that's 
now stopping. Um, and I think, it's be and it is because of Western influence, and there's a lot of text about that as well, about um, sort of our Western response to LGBTQ people. Yeah. Uh, back. So I think a lot of the minority population was wiped out, and right now, I think a lot of those, a lot of the minority populations, if I remember correctly, they're still pretty siloed into different pockets around Cambodia, um, but there has been a, a very, like I said, there has been a push um, to have justice and to try the people who perpetrated a lot of these crimes against these ethnic groups. We'll have to defer. Dr. Roncalli, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, the South Vietnamese who were the non-communist um, party, they were able to sort of come in, South Vietnamese were able to come in and sort of topple that government over the Khmer Rouge. Yeah.
there's a <laughs> there's a pretty <laughs> There's a pretty large Cambodian population, it's a decent sized Cambodian population in Santa Rosa in the Sonoma County area, um, which is what Ro Dr. Roncalli is talking about. She has the women's group of the Cambodian genocide, these women survivors, and they go into their ninth year. They meet every Thursday, I believe, um, and it's really, I think, in some therapeutic for them, and I think the first time they've really been able to come together to a safe space um, to try to tackle and talk about what happened. Um, and I think, speaking of like, you know, Denial and sort of what? What was this? Yeah, in Santa Rosa, there is a Buddhist, yeah, there's a Buddhist temple in, um, in Santa Rosa, and it really brings in the, it's a center of the Cambodian community, um, and it's, it's been really driven from the ground. Um, it's moved different places. Um, I believe it's officially recognized as a temple now, like they've gone through official paperwork for everything like that, and that's been a really big sort of staple in the Cambodian community in Santa Rosa. Um, with working together, I don't think, you know, again, they're not, when they come together, they're not talking about the genocide or necessarily healing from it, um, but they are coming together as a people. And a lot of the individuals, they've known each other since the Khmer Rouge. Like I, some of the people here in Sonoma that, that I live, where my family lives in Sonoma, we have neighbors that they've known since way back in Khmer Rouge days, um, and that they ended up sort of um, being refugees in similar groups and were able to come to this area together. So there is that population. And I think um, for my, I think it's interesting too for my mother who didn't really talk about the genocide a lot. And I went to Cambodia and I think there was a deep seated fear. Like my parents were like, why do you wanna go? We escaped from this country. Why do you wanna go back? And that's the thing I think it's sort of like second generation of us. Um, and I talked about some of my, fr uh, another friend of mine too, um, his family endured a different, um, Genocide, but he's like, you know, if they don't want me to go back, in a sense, like, that's their, right, like, I should respect that because that is their history, and if they're not ready for me to um, confront that, then that's something I should, you know, owe to them. Um, for me, I wanted to go back to learn more and to give back, and my mom was, my mom's still, like, very much afraid to go back to Cambodia, and she knows it's not a rational fear, but she was like, what if I go back and they don't let me out? And I'm just like, no, it's fine. <laughs> but, um, <I> swear <laughs> but she's still fear for that. And then my the notions my family members have about what happened in Cambodia, they think it's still sort of happening now. And they didn't trust. They didn't want me to go there by myself. Um, my dad, you know, it was his first time in 30 years. Like that was the first time I went back. Um, most a lot of my family members still haven't been back because that's something that they're not really ready to face yet. And I think it's similar to my mom. They're afraid of. They, what they what they think about Cambodia is like what they thought years ago. What they endure, that's what they see still. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there's a lot of student associations in um, different campuses. I know at Stanford, they have a Stanford Kamai Association, different schools. Um, UCSG has one. So there is some of that. I think it's, but the difficulty with that, but the second generation is if the second generation doesn't know about it and they don't really hear about it from their parents, it's not as much of a, I don't think it's as much of a reality to them. Because um, that's the thing, it's like the only reason why I really know about it is because one family member of mine talked about it a lot and gave me stories when I was, from when I was little. Um, and only recently now, as I've gotten older, my parents have been more willing to sort of give me more information. Um, but it was one family member, and I have a pretty big family, um, that, were, that was talking about it. So I think there are, you can see some shifts. You know, there's college groups. Um, I know in California, there's like the college, the Kamai associations all come together sometimes. Um, for a meeting once, I believe it's an annual meeting they have once a year, but I'm not sure, that's the thing, I'm not sure if they're tackling that sort of issue of like justice and what's happening afterwards, um, but I know there are student groups around. You can probably straight up just Google U.S. government Cambodia, <laughs> um, and there are there's a lot of literature and different like articles written about it. Um, so if you just do a blank Google search, a lot of things will pop up. Um, I think I'm trying to think if there's a specific text. Do you have? I can't think of one. Oh, yeah, yeah, Yale University has a, a genocide studies program. I want to quickly put dad, my dad on the spot because he had to survive this. Um, but dad, do you think for you, the trials happening now in Cambodia, do you find, what do you think about them? Do you find it helpful for you or no? Like, do you think, like, what do you think about the trials that are happening in Cambodia right now about for the Khmer Rouge? Huh? Here you go. Come closer. Here, come down. <laughs> no, but what do, you, what do you think about the trial? Like, do you think it's effective 
Like, do you find there's closure? Like, do you feel better that these trials are happening? Do you find, do you, I mean, talking about, do, do you feel, like, do you feel like you, f do you feel better because of it? Like, seeing all the people who are being put to, put in jail, does that make you feel better about what you, ha what happened to you? Thank you. 